step into the biochemistry area. First of all, right? She will um, share her experience on uh, toxic environment for cell membranes. Okay, so my uh, presentation is on the impact of hydrogen peroxide on uh, the phospholipid bilayer. Um, so my system, just to start out, is gigantic. So um, a lot of the calculations that were run were only being able to run for a short amount of time, uh, but we'll get there. Um, okay, so previous studies include a, in BASP as well, so like the same system that I was using. Uh, they were done with a smaller simulation, so the same phospholipid uh, bilayer as the one that I used. Uh, but only done with four solvent molecules. Um, so there's not like anything that happened in that could have possibly been a coincidence rather than not a coincidence, but like just because there wasn't too many solvent molecules rather than uh, more oxidation by it. Um, it was done in an aqueous solution. So there was hydrogen peroxide present as well as just plain old water molecules. Um, and what they concluded from that was that the presence of the water molecules causes the hydrogen peroxide uh, to decompose into two different species that do not interact negatively with the um, with the fossil the bilayer. Um, and so I wanted to look a little bit more into that because that didn't seem right that hydrogen peroxide would not affect the uh, fossil of the bilayer negatively. So I decided to make a different system. Um, but what the software that I used was vast for everybody else in this class. Um, I use periodic boundary conditions to simulate a bilayer. So I uh, reproduced it in the direction that would make a bilayer sheet, uh, which then would be wrapped around to form a cell. Um, so this is just supposed to represent like the outside of the cell. Um, and then I used 34 hydrogen peroxide molecules instead of just two. Uh, so that the system is a lot larger um, and it interacts more with the, the uh, Phospholipids, uh, two phospholipids, no water molecules. And then I put it at uh, 1500K, uh, which is extremely high. And I recognize that. Uh, but since there's, um, I don't have very much knowledge on this, so please don't ask me a question on it. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to uh, simulate, um, well, it's supposed to overcome the uh, quantum tunnelings that would occur naturally. Um, and I don't know much about that, but just giving it the extra temperature would allow it to get over the activation barrier and uh, be able to interact like it normally would in different situations. Uh, okay, so this is just the, I know most people know what the fossil of violet looks like, but this is the chemical composition of it. Uh, this is just a carbon chain uh, with the glycerol phosphate and then the choline at the top. Um, so that's how I, uh, arranged my bilayer, but the fatty acid, so it's like two instead of one. So anyways, so this is a side view of it. Uh, I have a different view as well, because this is kind of hard to see the distinction between the two. Um, but um, basically, this is the fatty acid chain. That's the glycerol, uh, phosphate, and then the choline. Uh, and then these are the peroxides. Uh, this is after the first round of uh, like dynamic, so that's why there's some loose hydrogens or protons. Um, I'm not sure, but it's one of the two. Um, so that's why it's not like 100% perfect. Uh, that's just this approximation. And this is a side view, so you can see that the chains are separated and they're not overlapping. Um, I just thought that there was it's easier to see two different views so you could actually get an understanding of like how they're interacting with each other. Okay, um, this is the uh, this is after the first uh, heating of it, so not molecular dynamics. Um, but the one thing that I wanted to, to show here is there is a uh, electron density right there. Uh, so they are bonded, um, and you can see that by um, this. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the word. By this picture, here we go. <laughs> um, and then after, I don't know why it's so grainy, um, but this one, this is after the first round of molecular dynamics, and so even though uh, it doesn't like the system, the software isn't showing a bond there. This theory is still a bond there because of the electron density that's present. Um, and then, so this is my simulation. Um, each molecular dynamic step took about an hour to run. Uh, so there's um, there's a few, <laughs> but uh, it takes a long time. So I couldn't go past uh, what I have here.
So the main thing that I wanted to point out is, I think it's here on this. Yeah, there you go. Um, if you look here, you're going to see a, the bilayer. Uh, um, this is what the main part that I was looking at as far as the uh, glycerol is hit by a molecule and it completely dissociates the fatty acid chain from the, um, from the head, uh, which would completely disintegrate the entire um, polar head of the molecule. That was my main uh, discovery through this was that, I mean, it would obviously impact it. Um, the temp one thing that I did want to address, I didn't put the graph in here because I didn't think it was worth it, but you can look in my uh, paper if you want to see the graph of temperature. Um, the temperature starts at 15K, 1500 grams, sorry, um, and escalates dramatically to about 50,000K, um, which is extremely significant and completely <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> like that's, that's not possible. Um, but I think that is because of the, like, the periodic conditions um, so that it's enclosed and it's basically burning the molecule, um, which would like all the bonds and the breaking and the forming and all that stuff is just causing mass chaos in the system, which would um, increase the heat dramatically. Uh, and so you can look into that a little bit more in the paper. Um, okay, that was. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> gap. Um, this is just what the software we produced. So um, yeah, but this is the actual energies of these uh, orbitals uh, rather than them being edited for since they're arbitrary. I don't think it really matters as long as this is the like, difference between or the middle of that is the difference between the homo and uh, this is what it looks like. Um, what I'm not fantastic at interpreting these graphs, especially for a system like this. Um, but what I was talking to Dimitri about was that uh, the bilayer should be transparent, um, but this indicates that it, it is not um, because of the wavelength that it uh, absorbs. So um, what we were thinking was that this was the dense basics and the transit in the homo to lumo would be between the fossil of the bilayer um, to the titanium dioxide, not titanium dioxide, we've been hearing a lot about that, hydrogen <laughs> peroxide. Um, and yeah, so those are basically my conclusions. It just uh, the, the hydrogen peroxide would break down the fossil to bilayer, and then um, it increases the heat dramatically. So it would probably burn the cell before if that has anything to do with the decomposition of it. And then without the presence of water, which is what the simulation previously has shown, uh, peroxide would be harmful, or at least at a higher concentration. And that's it. Okay, let's thank uh, Alisa for her great effort to simulate by DFT systems, which are typically not simulated by at this level of theory. So, technical question. So, you applied the early boundary conditions for kind of making your bio layer being deep, right? So, which means that any kind of, and when you optimize, you didn't let optimize yourself. I didn't have a chance to optimize. Mean to optimize well, you you didn't optimize your structure. No, I couldn't. Um, just because of the time, I just heated it up and then I ran another fluid dynamics on it. Oh, so you run just dynamics without optimization at room temperature. Mm -hmm. and, okay, but my point is that because you still have a cell size, mm -hmm. right? So and your 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 lipids are really very soft. They really wants to fold and do something like that probably, yeah. right? But if you already constrain them in this, and they cannot go beyond these boundaries, right? So you really put a lot of, I'll say, order in your system, probably artificial order, 
yeah. which might really kind of affect your overall results with interaction with this. Uh, other I'm, I'm sure it did, but I just. No, I, I understand you. Yeah, were I in the conditions to do at least something. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure that affected at least the the activity of the hydrogens first of all, because as you can see, they were going all over the place. Um, I'm sure that was because of the periodic conditions. Um, and I'm sure there's other effects of that in there, but I thought I'd give it a shot. That's kind of more questions. There was actually kind of similar oh, question. Oh, okay, so I, I noticed three in a row. Take pick somebody else. Yeah, but your system doesn't look like periodic. Is it periodic? Uh, it is periodic, it but it's just it's not like I didn't show it in here. It's like in vast it's periodic because the vacuum is only one angstrom. So then that's what it's in. And I'm asking you actually why you run the fifteen hundred? What is the significance of the fifteen hundred? I just chose a temperature okay. that was pretty hot. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's uh, the only significance of it. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, run a couple of faulty calculations because we were limited on resources. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to give it a really high temperature and hopefully that'll be enough. Um, I'm sure in future experiments, if this was worth pursuing, then I could lower the temperature and see where the lowest temperature would be, where it would still incorporate on the We have a few more questions. Well, so, so uh, when, when you showed the simulation, mm -hmm. the graphical simulation of, of the breaking of the glycol bond, yeah. it appeared to me it's like a ballistic collision. Yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Basically an inelastic collision that uh, transferred energy to some piece of the molecule that just went immediately beyond the dissociation energy and uh -huh. exploded. Yeah. Is, is that a, do you think, a chemically reasonable way to think about Oh, no, for sure not. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't claim that that is what would actually happen. Um, I, if I had more time to, to really plot what was happening, I would try and figure out where, uh, in previous studies, they have looked at the hydrogen bonding, uh, the hydrogen transfer throughout the fatty acid chain, and that would end up causing a imbalance uh, because there'd be unsaturated carbons. Um, and then at, in the end, that would end up disintegrating, basically, causing a dissociation from the fatty acid, no, from the, the head, and that would end up causing, so, that would most likely be, if I were to keep running these simulations, the cause of it, but this worked too. So I just kind of uh, took it and ran with it. Uh, but for future things, I would definitely not look at, you know, ballistic collision for that. So, so what do you think is happening to the hydrogen peroxide? So, so you, you point out in your conclusion that the hydrogen peroxide decomposes mm -hmm. in the absence of water, according to the simulation. Yeah. So what are what is the decomposition product? Of I believe that it is decomposing into um, um, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to look. hydroxide without not without a negative charge towards a radical species, which yeah. would interact with that. Hydroxyl. That's called. Yeah, but sorry, that's yeah. <laughs> anyways, um, okay. and but in with water present, it decomposes into um, H2O and O2, which would not negatively impact the cell. So, I mean, that's what I at least think would happen, but not sure. <laughs> so, if you take, so if you were to take a cell culture and start dropping in hydrogen peroxide, do you think the cells would survive? Probably not, no. Okay. So, water doesn't keep hydrogen peroxide from damaging cell membranes. Um, which, so, so that, that's why I'm asking these questions. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, how water plays into the thinking about the chemistry. Um, what, what do you think hydroxyl radical will do to the molecule? What is hydroxyl radical famous for? Um, I do not have the chemical background to answer your question. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, but <laughs> I would love to learn and figure it out. But that's kind of what I came up with for right now. Thank you. I have a question about your phosphorylators. What what is the chemical structure of those things? Uh. <clears throat> okay, so this is a different software than I use. Uh, so this is just this is the choline here. So that's the nitrogen. Um, 
as we see here. Uh, no. 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 Okay. So. There's a kink in both of them, I think. Yep. Okay. Yeah, right here. Okay, so that's an unsaturation. Both of them are unsaturated, yeah. Okay, so if they're unsaturated, why, why might it not be just there? I guess I don't know. Uh, I don't know. So alkene is transparent? Wait, say it? No. <laughs> well, you said you didn't do geometry optimization, right? Mm -hmm. So that's probably why it's not the right geometry, probably. Okay, and optimized geometries are alkenes transparent? Well, I've never computed the absorption probably stays somewhere in a UV range, right? Mm -hmm. So the absorption starts somewhere in a UV range for the alkenes. So, yeah. so for any other wavelengths, it should be transparent up to the way it starts absorbing, yeah. right? So there are uh, several things that one would do even for this large system for uh, targeting optical properties. So as Alyssa already mentioned, optimization, and second, uh, using uh, hybrid functions, which are much uh, slower, better in Oops, but we would not be good with the Expected that you would see that there is a reasonable bandwidth. Oh, okay. You get a homolumor excitation from just from having the alkene there. Mm -hmm. Actually, can you comment on your methodology and how much you can trust your band gap? Um, okay, well, what is, is your functional? Would you like I believe it's the PV functional. I'm pretty what sure. kind of dysfunction? What type of dysfunction? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, oh, maybe something mentioned about hybrid functionals, right? So you should answer. So it looks like if he mentioned about hybrid <laughs> functions, this is definitely not a hybrid function. Okay. And I don't know, did you have a discussion about choice of the functionals and the effect of functionals on your Electronic properties. I uh, I, I don't know. I would have to look more into it. Well, I guess again, you there are all people like so. No one were using any other functional except GG uh, except the PBE functional for this class. I, I see. So so the question about functionals were not really a question. You you trust that what you can get with your PBE functional is really good for any kind of systems you were calculating, right? Or any, there are any no, other I mean, ideas from the class? that's obviously not true. It's just with the time constraint, I don't think we necessarily learned enough to mess with the functionalists, nor be able to do it ourselves. It's that, that's what me personally. But at least, it's the first thing which you do when you calculate. You need to figure out what is your methodology, right? And you need to get at least some ideas what kind of type of functionals you choose, and what to expect from these functionals. So when you take a pure GGA functionals, pure DFT functionals, are you expecting that your band gaps, your energies would be underestimated? Yes? What if you use Hartley fog? Are you expecting your, your band gaps would be also underestimated? Then what they will do? Accurate? So this was part of the class. What would be the consequence of applying Hartley fog to the uh, same system? Like, uh, where would it change the uh, gap? Yeah. Where? Where? To higher or lower value? Alisa, show it again. Good chest. Oh, yes. Good. <laughs> <My dear>. Okay. <laughs> so, so Hartley Fock will kind of give you two big gaps. The GGA functions typically provides two small gaps, right? And that's why people add some Hartley Fock portion to the GGA, which we call hybrid functionals which will kind of balance both of these arrows and end up with something more reasonable. So that's why having your band gaps low than it is expected in experiment, if you're using your PBE, it doesn't matter which system you use, is, is a very typical error, is a well-known error. You, you should not really expect it to be, if you get it very close to experiment, then something is wrong with your calculation. <laughs> <laughs> more questions to Alyssa? 
one more question. Uh, the periodic boundary condition. So if I understand this right, you have it set up so that there's an infinite number of uh, the same system that you're modeling here. Yeah, so and I, I made an error in my, my paper. I said it was periodic in the Z, Z condition, and that's not right. No, it's just X and Y? Uh, yes, I believe so. Either yeah. It's either just X or just Y. I'm pretty sure it's just it's one or the other. Making a line. Yes, exactly. The line goes for infinite? Yes, I think so. It's, I think that's how this is true. It's your boundary condition. So you have an infinite number of the fatty acid chains, but and then each of them are having the peroxide shot <coughs> at the same time? Mm -hmm. Is that how this is working? Okay. Yeah. That's probably why your temperature goes insane. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. Because it just like, it explodes basically. The temperature just because becomes extremely it hot. It's near its neighbor exploding at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes. So so she's really having an infinite DCT. Yeah. Infinite <laughs> explosions. <laughs> Which is really artifact, right? Yeah, I mean. Okay, last chance for questions to Alyssa. If not, I thank her once again. And uh, until the booking is valid for this room, we have two more talks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now we are departing from uh, surfaces and from biochemistry and going more to inorganic uh, chemistry uh, and catalytic.